to the third segment in this first theme, the world of Jesus. Remember the matrix. We talked about the matrix is Jesus as a homeland Jew within eschatological Judaism, within Roman imperialism. And in this first theme, we'll be stressing mostly Roman imperialism. Eschatological Judaism will be, in a way, the next three themes, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We're looking at Roman imperial theology. And that's very careful language. I'm not talking about mythology, as if they did mythology, but we do theology. This is Roman imperial theology. And my claim is very, very straightforward. If you don't know Roman imperial theology, you will not be able to understand Christian theology, Pauline theology, New Testament theology, because it is set over against it. If you think of Caesar as an incarnate program of peace through victory, then Jesus is an alternative incarnate program. And you have to name it. And we got a first hint of it already, though we'll talk much more about it in the next themes, peace through justice. But back to Roman imperial theology. And a crucial element is that all of this could have been just a, a personal charisma of Caesar Augustus. It could all have died with him. He could have said, this is just the way he was, but he was divine, sure, but forget it. But this personal charisma became a dynastic character and then an imperial character. The glue that held the Roman Empire together was Roman imperial theology. The emperor was divine. And divinity depended on victory. No victory, no divinity. End of victory, end of divinity. So that's what we're exploring. And I'm going to take you now to a third area, two places actually. We're going to look at the acts of the divine Augustus. The title in Latin is Res Geste Divi Augusti. Here's what happened. Before his death, Caesar Augustus, he died in 14 CE, 14 in the Common Era. So we're moving again our timeline from 31 BCE at Axiom through 9 BCE at Priene. We're now up to 14 CE. Before he died, Caesar Augustus wrote out a, a short biography, you could call it, like a memoir, his acts, all the things he did, a sort of a Apologia pro vita sua, apology for his life. Not apology in our sense of saying I'm sorry, but the acts of the divine Augustus. We're going to look at that. Originally what he wanted done was these were to be inscribed on two marble tablets on either side of his great mausoleum in Rome. He had built a magnificent round mausoleum for himself and his family. He built it almost as a rebuttal way back because they had heard that Antony, before he was defeated at Axiom and died, suicide at Alexandria, was going to make his own tomb in Alexandria. So right away, Augustus said, I'll make my tomb in Rome. I'm a Roman, not an Egyptian, as it were. So this was written, it's about you know, 2,500 words, I guess, on either side of his mausoleum, and then copies, copies, were to be made on every temple to Roma and Augustus. All over the Roman Empire, there were temples. Not huge temples, because the Roman idea was not to build a huge temple like, say, Diana of the Ephesians, but a small temple in the highest place in the city. A small temple in a high place with a plaza around it, and you had to climb up, and you had to go up steps, and you're looking up all the time. And if your neck is hurting, you're getting the message. The temples of Roman Augustus were supposed to have this carving on them. Now imagine, imagine the poor mason who had to carve in Latin and then maybe in Greek as well, 
2,500 words, you know, in tiny letters, line after line after line, and he probably didn't know what he was carving. So we're going to go to two places. The first place is called Pisidian Antioch, or Antioch in Pisidia. It's a place you probably know from the New Testament because Paul went there on his mission when he was under Barnabas. Barnabas was in charge. It's in the Acts of the Apostles. He went there along with Barnabas and gave a, a great lecture there or a speech. Pisidian Antioch, it's a gorgeous site. It's, it's above in the mountains, above the Lake District in Turkey, which is very, very beautiful. Lakes like Lake Yildan. This is above it. It's a beautiful site and it's empty. And sometimes when you go to Pisidian Antioch, you almost have to go down to the nearby village of Yalvach, filled with people, and take the people and put them up there in Pisidian Antioch. Otherwise, you're just looking at ruins. But you're also looking at a, a gate through which Paul would have gone, and you're looking at a road, and Paul would have gone up this road, and then it opens up to a plaza. And again, this is very Roman, a small temple in a big plaza. Not a big temple, but a small temple in a big plaza, lots of people looking around. You go to the plaza, to, to a gate, and there in front of you is the temple, the ruins now, of course, of the temple, Rome and Augustus. It's the highest point, and they've carved into the, into the mountain behind it, as it were, a double circular tier like that to frame it. The temple is not huge. It's just an ordinary square temple with the columns around it, and inside, of course, would be the cult statues of Roma and Augustus, the divine couple now, center new world order. But what interests us is on that gateway going into it is a copy of the Acts of the Divine Augustus. Unfortunately, most of it is in fragments. If that was all we have, we'd have nothing. Tiny fragments. I've seen images of, of the ruins of Pisidian Antioch years ago when the excavations were made, and as you see them today, and you say, wait a minute, there was far more stuff there 50 years ago. It's because it's become a, a quarry, actually. It's become a quarry for the people of Yalbach. And indeed, today, when some of the houses are being torn down and new houses are going up, stuff goes back to the museum that they find. Somebody turns over, they step into their house and finds an inscription on it. But on this door, on this gateway, a triple arch gateway, the full text originally was there for the Acts of the Divine Augustus. When you read the Acts of the Divine Augustus, we have the full text. I'll talk about that later. You see again, and now you almost know it by heart, religion, war, victory, peace. He talks about all the, all the I almost said churches, all the temples he restored. All the temples he restored. Religion must come first. You keep the worship of the gods and the friendship of the gods. Then you go to war. He mentions all the people he conquered. He mentions all his victories. But at the end, he insists twice before, in all of Roman history, the doors of the temple of war were closed, the temple of Janus. Now, for a third time under me, they've been closed. Victory. Take you from Pisidian Antioch take you eastward to Ankara, the temple, excuse me, the capital now of the Republic of Turkey. It was Ancyra, the capital of the Galatian province of Rome in the first century. Now remember, Paul wrote to the Galatians. We all know that. I'm thinking now of the Acts of the Divine Augustus as an earlier letter to the Galatians, because every chunk we've ever found of the Acts of the Divine Augustus happens to be in Galatia. It's a new province, and maybe the, <laughs> the advertising machine is working harder there than anywhere else. So, Ankara, huge modern city. You go up towards the ruins of the Temple of Roma et Augustus. Here we go again, the Temple to Rome and Augustus. In a way, it's extraordinary it's still there, because it's sort of built into the wall of a mosque, and it's sort of protected by the mosque's offices. They've, they've kept it up. 
you go there and they have the full text in Rome, in excuse me, in Latin and in Greek of the Res Geste Divi Augusti, as it's called in Latin, the Acts of the Divine Augustus. As you enter, uh, by the way, the, the temple opens towards the west. It opens towards Rome. As you enter this temple, on your side here and on your side there, in the, the inter, in, introductory part of the temple, the narthex, as it were, if it was a cathedral, you read the Acts of the Divine Augustus on both sides, small letters. But it begins in huge, big letters, maybe about this high, because it's a copy, of course. It says, a copy understood, of the Acts of the Divine Augustus by which he brought the whole world under the dominion of the Roman people. That's the opening. Res geste divi Augusti, by which the orbum terrarum, the orb of the world, was brought under the imperium of the Roman people. I, remember, I remind you something I said before. It's never just about the Mediterranean or Italy or, or Rome. It's about the world. He never claimed just to be the imperator for the Mediterranean. We, we might jeer a bit and say, oh, come on, it's the world. He doesn't even know the world. They talked about the world. So don't be surprised if you find Christianity then talking about the world, because Caesar's claims are to the world. So you walk into the temple. On either side, with this big heading, you read in small Latin print, religion, war, victory, peace. These are the themes of it. And he also tells you the amount of money he spent and everything else. Then on the outside, it would be on the south wall, you have a Greek summary of that. A Greek summary of the whole thing. So people who knew Greek could read it, and people who, again, didn't know Latin, that's fine. They're getting the message. They're getting the message, you don't understand this. That's right. We're in charge. The fact that you don't understand it is not the point. A whole wall filled with unintelligible Latin to most Greek audience is the point. And of course, there's going to be steps going up. Today, when you walk up to the temple, it's like a little island, island of silence in the middle of this bustling city. There's nothing there except uh, women with their babies in, in strollers and old men drinking coffee. And sur you're surrounded by parked cars, and it's quiet, except for the mosque, of course, which is, often has funerals. And then the temple. It's the highest point. You walk up to it. So you look at this and you think, everywhere you look, everywhere you look in the Roman world, you're getting the same message. I don't want to use the word propaganda because that might sound like it's coming from Rome and being you know, forced down people's throats. The Mediterranean world must have breathed a huge sigh of relief when the, the Roman wars ended because they were getting the brunt of it. It must have been like, Thank God it's over. Oops. Who are we thanking? Well, we're thanking Octavian. But then Octavian must be divine. Because for the Romans, like the Greeks before them, there were human beings, human beings who could be raised to divine status. They knew, of course, of the immortal gods like Zeus or Jupiter, but they also believed that certain human beings could be Ordinary human beings, stick them with a pin that go out, could be raised to divine status, and when they died, they were taken up to the gods. If, if they had done something of extraordinary value for the human race. So now we're getting the job description of what it means in the first century to be divine. The claim is being made. You have done something extraordinary for the human race. And if we don't like that language, if we, we, we had an enlightenment here, we don't do divine stuff anymore. We're sons of God, we don't do that male stuff. That's our problem. As far as they were concerned, to say Caesar was divine is to make a claim he has done something extraordinary for the world. If you say, what has he done? Everyone would tell you he's brought peace to the world. So if you're going to make those claims for Jesus, you have to have a counter-program and a counter-program incarnate in Jesus. So, when you look at Roman Augustus, 
anywhere you look, the temples, the shrines, the inscriptions, the coins, the coins, the only, the only mass medium of antiquity, the images on the coins, they're not boring like our coins. You know, don't change. They change all the time because you're getting messages. This is mass communication, first century style. And the message you're getting, the peace of the Roman Empire depends on religion. You must stay faithful to the gods. They must be on your side. Then you can go to war. And they would have said, look around you. How, how, can, how can you argue with it? We have brought peace to the world. And again, we're back to the crucial question. This has been the mantra of empire from the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medes, the, the Persians, the Macedonian Greeks, every empire there ever have been, up to our own, has said, you get peace through victory. And then, there is no other way. And so we're back with the basic question of human existence and of our species. Is there an alternative way to peace through victory? Because what we now know after 6,000 years of experience is that you don't get peace. You only get a period without war until the next round. And the next round then has always been more violent. So when you turn towards, as we will, eschatological Judaism, don't worry about that term if it's a new term. When you turn towards eschatological Judaism, which is the, the, the Jewish matrix of Jesus, the question we're going to have to raise is, what is that alternative? The model I have in my own mind for these two visions for the world are like tectonic plates. You know how beneath our, our earth there's tectonic plates that grind against one another and give us, give us earthquakes and volcanoes and tsunamis where they grind. I think of peace through victory as one giant tectonic plate below history. And the alternative tectonic plate below history, I don't know if it's as big as the other one, but it's there, is peace through justice. Peace through violent victory, peace through nonviolent justice. Over here, religion, war, victory, and peace is the sequence. Over here, it's religion, nonviolence, justice, and peace. And we spend much more time on that. But even for the moment, if you say, well, what's this justice stuff? Justice is where everyone has enough.